signal. And the recording has, uh, has started, so anybody objecting to that should leave now. Um, a warm welcome uh, on behalf of uh, Lars and myself. Um, my name is Frans Melissen. And together with Lars, uh, we are the holders of the Chair in Management Education for Sustainability, uh, a joint initiative of Antwerp Management School and Breda University of Applied Sciences. Uh, great to see uh, that you are joining us today for this uh, third and uh, final session of the uh, PRME Education Academy Seminar Series of this year. Um, and as you know, one of the main objectives uh, of this series is to uh, get inspired by cutting edge and thought provoking scholarly and uh, practitioner insights on responsible management education. And we aim to offer these from a variety of perspectives. And for this, uh, we have already and today as well, uh, give the floor to uh, several renowned scholars and fellow academics who will share their ideas and results of their work. And today this will be on the topic of alternatives um, after arts and um, activism in the first two seminars. Today is the, the topic is alternatives, um, alternatives for management education and the institution that we call a business school. Um, now, since we expect this final session, given its topic, to be uh, particularly provocative, uh, you are warmly invited to participate in the discussion in, uh, in the final part of the session after Martin has given his introduction. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask questions uh, to the speaker or to the uh, reference, uh, which will be introduced by Lars in, uh, in a minute. Uh, and challenge them by taking a provocative stance uh, yourself towards their ideas and contentions. Uh, we would ask you to do that through the chat function of this meeting uh, so that uh, Lars and I can make sure that your question ends up uh, where it should end up at the appropriate time. So please use the chat function to, uh, to put forward your questions uh, or IDs. Yes, so on, <clears throat> we're happy to have a great speaker <clears throat> as well as, uh, if I may say so, some great reference on today's uh, webinar that carries the title Organizing the Future, How to Rebuild Management Education. We have the pleasure of having Martin, Martin Parker as today's speaker, while Meta, Meta Morsing and Franz and I will take our role as reference. So let me introduce Martin just briefly to you. He's a vocal critic of the idea of, well, you could say the business school as we know it. Uh, and as he describes himself, actually a worried inhabitant of the third rock from the sun. Uh, by the way, you will also learn from the photo on his Twitter bio that he's an avid drummer, or it seems so. I don't actually know if that's the case. Uh, what I have seen is that that picture does show Martin in kind of a Ricky Gervais type of style. I'm not sure what that's, uh, that, that means, but on a serious note, Martin is affiliated with the uh, University of Bristol School of Management, where he's a professor of organization studies. He's the lead for the Bristol Inclusive Economy Initiative and a distinguished fellow of the Schumacher Institute. Uh, from his academic bio, we read that uh, his research and writing widens the scope of business and management studies, whether in terms of particular sorts of organizations, the worker, co-ops, circus, even the zoo, or ways of representing organizing in art, cartoons, and films, and that he's interested in the philosophy of the concept of the organization. So his recent books were Life After COVID-19, uh, Anarchism, Organization and Management, while the one that you may perhaps know best is the book titled uh, Shut Down the Business School. Uh, we're honored to have you on today's uh, final session in the series, uh, Martin. Today's referent is Meta, Meta Morsing, as I said, which I suppose does not need any introduction for this audience. Meta, thanks a lot for uh, being with us for this uh, final seminar in the series, also because I know you've traveled a lot recently and that your agenda is nothing short of uh, a, a nightmare. Uh, and in any case, um, thank you on uh, behalf of all of us for your service in the field of uh, responsible management education around the world. Um, as for the flow of the session, Martin will start with his talk. When he has finished, uh, we'll give Meta the floor for a brief ref reflection. Uh, and Franz and I will also give our reflection. And after we have finished, we'll give the floor to anyone uh, who has a question or a, a story to share. Martin, the digital floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, uh, Lars, and thanks to both you and France for inviting me to uh, to speak today, um, and thanks in advance to Meta for uh, for responding as well. I um, I'll talk for about 35 40 minutes, um, uh, and then look forward to a, a discussion. I guess the first thing I'd want to say, um, given um, a, a little conversation I was having with Meta beforehand, um, is that this is a view from the UK. You know, this is um, a particular perspective on the uh, last 20 or 30 years of management education and where we've got to. And I'm, I'll, I'll be particularly interested in, in, in conversations about, you know, how this lands in other, um, in other countries and other regions of the world. Um, it's unusual, after all, to get an audience which is quite so geographically diverse as this. Normally, we're talking, you know, in in our in our little circles. Um, and I suspect that one of the things I'm going to learn from this is that my generalizations about all management education everywhere aren't necessarily any more than the usual myopia of somebody who's just looking around the corner. So let me start off by uh, sharing the screen and then we'll start the presentation. So can you can you see that? OK. Yeah, that's great. Thank yes. you. I'll just put it on slideshow. Right. Um, so, organizing the future, how to rebuild management education. Oh, of course, the thing's not going to move now, is it? Sorry, bear with me. It's. Uh... Ah, there we go. My, my critiques of management education are not by any means unique. You know, I don't want to kind of be suggesting or get anybody thinking that I'm the only person who's ever criticized management education. I suppose I'm broadly part of this critical management studies thing. And many people involved in critical management studies have been routinely bashing management education for the last 30 years. But more generally, I think it's important to recognize that management education is the subject of much broader forms of skepticism, of, of very often hostility. That's to say, you know, that the business schools are not places with particularly good reputations. This is a little clip from the Matt Groening cartoon Futurama in which uh, a, uh, a delightful monkey called Gunter uh, decides at the end of one of the episodes that all he wants is to be a monkey of moderate intelligence who wears a suit and consequently he's going to go to business school because that's the kind of place and we we have an endless array of these kinds of cultural criticisms of the business school of of the way in which the business school is purported to produce a certain kind of selfishness or utilitarianism um almost as if it's a kind of um uh, a, a sort of a cook pot for producing a certain kind of person who then goes on to be routinely cruel and selfish and so on. It's important for us to recognise that because I think that that sort of cultural condemnation exposes, sadly, a deeper truth about the way that business school education <clears throat> excuse me, about the way that business school education is conducted and very often about the kinds of results of business school education, the consequences of it um, in terms of both questions of inclusion, um, questions of democracy, and also, of course, um, ideas about sustainability and carbon reduction. The history of the business school is really not the one that's usually told. It doesn't begin in the United States. It really begins in Northwestern Europe. Um, and many of the first business schools are really um, commercial schools set up by chambers of commerce, by, by local businessmen, usually men, um, in places like Paris and Anvers and, uh, and so on. And these kinds of schools are very often established it, as, as, as a kind of technical training. Um, the, the, the very first ones are usually described as accounting schools. They're, kind of t they're teaching book, bookkeeping pretty much. But they're interestingly multicultural places. And I think there's, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot more research that, that could, could be done 
on the kind of the forms of business education that we see developing in Northwest Europe in the in the 19th century. I'm putting that there in part because I want to displace the next part of the story, which is, you know, the normal one, the standard account, if you like, which is that business school education begins in the United States in something like the 1870s. So places like Wharton and Harvard and various others, um, which have gone on to become um, gigantically important to defining the field. But it's just important to say that you know, other histories could have been written, other, other ways of accounting for business school education. But nonetheless, the kind of the imaginary and the content of business school education is certainly um, constructed by those American business schools, really from something like the um, 1870s to about the 1930s, when most of the big schools, big US schools are established. Now, and this is an audience I barely need to say this to, the um, business, school business school education market is global and gigantic. Um, in 2011, the AACSB guessed, uh, estimated, or guessed, that there were roughly 13,000 business schools in the world. I've been trying to update that figure, but it seems very, very difficult to do it. That's That's some kind of guesstimate i'd be really interested in anybody's got any more reliable figures because of course as soon as we go to any of the validation um agencies and the uh, wacsb and so on then really you're only scratching the the tip of the iceberg in terms of the numbers of business schools that exist according to wacsb um in 2011 there was something like three thousand private schools of business in india alone um and business schools are pretty profitable businesses. Um, in uh, uh, I, I checked this figure yesterday, London Business School, which is currently advertising a tuition fee of uh, £97,500 for its MBA. That's an 18-month course. That's, of course, uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't account for eating and, uh, and housing in London, which is a pretty expensive place to live. But if we do the sums on this kind of stuff, business schools globally must have a fee income, a fee income alone of something like $400 billion. Okay, so we're talking about a very big global industry, one which is concentrated certainly in certain parts of the, uh, certain parts of the globe, in North America and Northwestern Europe, but by no means isolated to there. This is a, uh, a big industry. So the School of Business then is a huge, if you like, both cultural and economic phenomena. It's a, um, a form of global education, which I don't think we've really seen before. Um, and even though it's not formally standardized in any way, it certainly has a particular kind of grammar and series of accepted divisions and stories that are told about it. So, you know, we could argue, I'm going to push this one hard, but we could argue this is the first example of, if you like, a global form of education. So what do business schools do? And this is a bit superfluous for this audience. This is London Business School itself in its uh, extremely lovely surroundings overlooking Regent's Park in, in West London. This is London Business School's strap line. And... Um, it's kind of important to note that the appeal of most business schools, when you look at the, uh, uh, the, the kind of the quick summaries of what they do, is primarily an appeal to the individual. It's an appeal to somebody who's going to invest a substantial amount of money in themselves. And the, the reassurance being given is that this will be a form of investment which pays back. Uh, in terms of salary or expertise or career bumps or whatever it might be. Okay, so, so, you know, the pitch, if you like, is not a collective one. It's nothing to do with liberal ideas about education or whatever else. It's primarily about the idea that you will benefit from investing in yourself. And what do B-Schools actually teach? This is, the, uh, this is the slide that annoys most people most of the time. So my apologies for this, but this is my kind of one slide summary of 95% uh, of business schools, 95% of the time. 
So first of all, they tend to teach about corporations. The corporation is the kind of the default big organization that is assumed to be most relevant for case studies, for economic analysis, for understanding international management, for thinking about HR, et cetera, et cetera. It's the kind of, it's, it's, the, it's simply the kind of the, the uh, organization, if you like. And the corporation, of course, is a particular organizational form that focuses on shareholder value. So by focusing on the corporation as the most important organization, so is shareholder value embedded as the most important form of value. Other forms of value are available, as we're all aware, but shareholder value is given a particular kind of primacy because of the focus on the corporation. Secondly, growth is assumed to be a good thing. This is you know, it's essentially the outcome of um, a certain set of assumptions about economics and economic systems. But the assumption seems to be that growth, um, whether of numbers of people or number of territories served or number of products made or whatever it might be, is assumed to be the measure of success. Obviously, this tessellates quite nicely with the previous point uh, because corporations uh, are, have, if you like, a kind of economic growth imperative built into them, partly because that satisfies the demands of shareholder value. But more than that, growth is assumed to be the kind of necessary criteria of success in organisational and wider economic systems. And then finally, I would argue that the kind of the third principle, if you like, of management education is, of course, that management is a necessary um, practice and cadre of individuals uh, for any organization. That's effectively to say that forms of hierarchy are inevitable in organizations, that any organization has to have, this is the, the, you know, the, the sort of the implicit argument, if you like, that any organization has to have a cadre of people, usually or almost always, better paid or compensated, as the euphemism goes, um, in order that they can conduct decision making, that they can see into the future using the tools of strategy, that they can understand the um, arcane and difficult concepts about management and financial accounting and so on, so that, so that managers are embedded as a particular category of people um, within any organization that's necessary in order for us to organize. Now, in this talk, I'm really going to be challenging each one of those. I'm going to be suggesting that corporations are by no means the only form of organizing, that growth is increasingly dangerous and pathological, um, and that there are plenty of ways in which we can think about organizing which do not embed uh, a particular cadre of organizers and assume that everybody else can't organize themselves. But if we ask who this, if you like, this kind of um, tr trident of arguments is for in the, in the context of the business school curriculum, well, it seems to be it's for those who benefit from or want to benefit from the standard model of capitalism. Now, the standard model of capitalism is a problem. And I just want to very quickly run through some of these issues. So capitalism generates staggering forms of inequality, forms of inequality that currently are producing um, a category of individuals who are probably the wealthiest individuals the planet has ever known, richer even than the pharaohs, comparatively. Capitalism generates gigantic forms, uh, interlocking networks of um, hegemonic, hegemonic, sorry, hegemonic corporations. Uh, this is uh, just a, a sort of a map of a set of relations in the food sector, for example. Capitalism generates externalities routinely. Capitalism, capitalist economics assumes some kind of infinite space into which the, the externalities of the economy can be thrown. And finally, as we all know, capitalism is generating climate change. It's really important to understand that if we want to address climate change, then we also need to address the ways in which 
global capitalist markets operate. So when we're speaking about this gigantic complex of business school education, 13,000 schools at least, and thinking about the kinds of things that most of them are teaching most of the time, then I think it's probably just, it's reasonably safe to talk about this as an ideological program, not simply a form of education, but an ideological program, which is producing a particular set of accounts of the way that the economy should operate and the way that organisation should happen, and selling that to a certain cadre of individuals who imagine themselves to be, um, and very often are, um, occupying particularly elevated roles within the contemporary economy. So I'm going to say management education is an ideological project. But what do most business schools actually do about this? You know, if you like, this is a kind of question, what's the internal criticisms? Well, you know, there's critical management studies, of course. You know, there's people like me who have been uh, gibbering on for quite a long time about, you know, various forms of feminist, anarchist, green, post-colonial, socialist, da-da-da-da, kind of alternatives to thinking about organisation, about political economy more generally. Um, and that stuff really has been um, has, has been happening for about 30 years within North, particularly within Northwest European business schools, to a certain extent in the USA as well, um, and spottily in other parts of the globe. But in those 30 years, it's made very little difference. You know, the lots of people have written lots of things. An ocean of ink has been drained in order to produce endless papers about this, that, and the other. You know, you say Foucault, I say Marx, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But in terms of actual change, I think it would be difficult to argue that CMS has done very much, has had much impact. Perhaps something which has had more impact is the kind of the softer internal critique, which is represented by corporate social responsibility, ideas about diversity, sustainability, ethics, and so on. So a kind of, if you like, um, a more respectable, but gentler form of critique, which takes place within the business school. Um, but I would argue, and obviously I'm at risk of offending some of my audience here, I would argue lacks a particularly radical edge in order to address the severity of the problems that faces us at the moment. So in a sense, you know, my, 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 my criticism of the kind of, of the existing forms of critique is effectively that, you know, they're, they're a war of the pen. They end up as producing new ideas in classrooms that don't necessarily impact on the, the world of organisation and business in any, any, any kind of reasonable and, and effective way. Nonetheless, of course, many of us, many of us here in you know, audiences like this and elsewhere are involved in forms of organisation that um, are aimed at producing some kind of different form of economy and organisation. So many of us might go on demonstrations or be members of political parties. Perhaps we orient our consumption towards particular forms of ethical purchasing. Perhaps we just, you know, click and sign some, um, uh, sign some uh, uh, um, uh, on, on online petitions every so often and so on, or boycott various forms of activity. I'm trying to, in a sense, open up the possibility there that business schools might actually not be talking about all the forms of organizing that exist in the world. And that we're missing a trick if we think that politics is restricted to the kind of war of the pen, the ideas in the classroom. Because I think that opening up organizing to think about activism of various different kinds also allows us then to open up the curriculum of the business school. Because, and this is for me, you know, kind of, if you like, a key equation, it has been for quite a long time, to say that organising is not the same as management. That organising is a concept that is bigger than management. Management is a specific form of organisation. And really, I'm going to be arguing in the, in the kind of the, the next 10 minutes or so, that the proper subject of the, um, the school of business should be organizing, that it should become a school for organizing, because organizing is a generous concept 
that can allow us to include lots of different forms of organization. And it varies. Organizing varies historically, spatially, nationally, ethnically. Organizing is not, uh, um, is, is, is not, uh, does not assume a form of hierarchical organization by a cadre of people who've been trained as managers. So organizing, I'm simply defining, and you know, very generously and vaguely here, I guess, as the proper object of inquiry of that part of a university, which is concerned with patterns of exchange relationships, with the production of value, with the generation of organizations. And the reason I'm pushing at this is because I don't think that the business school, and remember in the UK, the vast majority of business schools are parts of universities. Um, I don't think the business school um, is really fulfilling what it's set up to do, what it could be set up to do. And the, 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 way, the way I try and demonstrate this is by trying to get you to think about a history department that only teaches about the 15th or 19th centuries or a geography department that only taught about you know, certain parts of the, war, of the world or a medical school that you know, ignores certain parts of the human body. Because effectively, I think what we've got is a business school that only teaches about certain kinds of forms of organisation that effectively ignores lots of other organisational forms. This is what sociologists in the 1960s, 1970s used to talk about as the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is that which doesn't get taught in school. It was usually applied to questions of gender and ethnicity in the 1960s and 70s. So say, you know, uh, if girls weren't taught that uh, girls could be professors or could be scientists or could be uh, cultural producers of different kinds, then effectively they were being taught that only boys did those kinds of things. So it's what, what, what wasn't being taught was just as important as what was being taught because the lesson of not teaching about something is it doesn't matter. So what's the hidden curriculum of the business school then? What's not being taught? Well, I would argue that the hidden curriculum of the business school is pretty much anything that isn't a corporation. This is a big generalization, but that there are lots of different forms of organizing, and this is a, a short list of some of them, which are common and important and raise all sorts of interesting questions about inclusion, about sustainability, about democracy, and so on but there are not routinely taught about within the School of Business. When I um, pull back from some of these questions, I, I sometimes think about the sort of the way in which we might approach diversity. This is um, the introduction from a book that my mother-in-law gave me. Uh, the uh, Royal, Source, Royal Horticultural Society's Gardeners Encyclopedia, which is a big, beautiful book of plants and flowers, um, which is a kind of, you know, an, an, an encyclopedic uh, attempt to list all the different sorts of plants and flowers. So there are, you know, tall trees in there and there are plants that live in salty environments and there are plants that move and plants that live underwater and plants that live in very cold places and so on. There are big plants and small plants and plants that photosynthesize and plants that don't, et cetera, et cetera. An enormous diversity of plants. The point is that in order to address the question, the botanists who constructed the Royal Horticultural Society's Gardeners Encyclopedia didn't assume that there was kind of one organizing principle that was more important than others. They document diversity. They document the wide variety of ways in which the plant world has adapted to different sorts of circumstances in different times and different places. Now this, it seems to me, is a really important lesson for us if we want to think about how we rescue the business school from itself. Because difference and diversity are absolutely crucial to understanding different forms of organisation, to thinking about co-ops and mutuals and, uh, and um, uh, different ways of imagining financial systems and different ways of thinking about employment and so on, are vital if we're going to be constructing complex organizational systems which address the kinds of questions that face us. My favorite word in this list is experimentalism, um, which comes from really from the writing of Roberto Unger, the um, 
Brazilian social theorist. Um, and Unger really likes this sort of idea that, that any form of uh, social theory and politics should really be constructing experimental alternatives, thinking about ways in which we could imagine otherwise, but not imagining that there would be one solution to any problem, but really playing with different sorts of uh, conceptions of politics and economy in order to produce different kinds of results. About um, 15 years ago, I, together with some colleagues, um, constructed this thing called a dictionary of alternatives, uh, subtitled Utopianism and Organization. And what we wanted to do was to produce a gigantic book, which had a huge list of different ways of thinking about economy and organizing. Um, we wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, and we ended up with about, I think it was about a quarter of a million words. It was a huge, a huge lump. Much of it kind of stolen from bits of Wikipedia and things that we'd read and whatever else. But the idea was it was this kind of capacious um, attempt to document a whole variety of different forms of organization. And you could read about the mafia, which would then pass you on to ways in which terrorist groups organize, which would throw you to some utopian community in, you know, I don't know, in Belgium in the 13th century or whatever it might be. It was a kind of, it was intended to be a rich, a rich tapestry. So we sent this to um, Z Books, who were publishing it, and they sent it back and said, I'm sorry, we didn't agree to publish a quarter of a million words. You're going to have to cut half of the words. And so we cut the book down to 120 words, 120 words, 120,000 words. And this is the uh, contents page from the 120,000 word book. And as you can see, it's very dense. It's lost loads of stuff. You know, it was twice this size before. But one of these entries, and uh, I can't really point to it because I haven't got my pointer enabled. But if you look um, about two thirds of the way down on the right hand side, one of those entries is management. In a sense, that's all that matters about the book, in a way. It's, you know, it's a kind of, it's an artwork as book, because all that you need to know is that other alternatives are available. And indeed, that there are plenty of ways of thinking about organising, which are not reliant on managerial ideas of hierarchy of a particular cadre of individuals with a certain kind of expertise, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what I'm pushing for, and uh, I'll willingly accept donations from any millionaires who are on this call, is the idea that we should be replacing business schools, bulldozing them, if you will, and replacing them with what I call a school for organizing. And this would be a school that teaches about the possibility of a low carbon economy, about localized supply chains, about collective and democratic forms of ownership and control, and teaches about an economy in which small is beautiful, growth isn't necessary, growth isn't assumed to be the only way in which organizations are successful and responsibility to people and planet is the means and ends of business. In other words, that externality is seen to be a problem that we need to overcome. Now, this is a particular way of thinking about how we would construct a kind of, if you like, a sort of an experimental curriculum for forms of organising an economy, which will allow us to address the huge challenges that I outlined at the start challenges of inequality, challenges of carbon reduction, of the ecological crisis and so on. So moving to a conclusion. The school for organizing needs to be an organizing school. It needs to be, it needs to address the question of organization as a political question, not something that happens after politics but something which is itself politics made durable. That's to say that when we construct an organization, we're constructing particular kinds of assumptions about who benefits, about how who occupies particular kinds of roles, about who has knowledge, who has the power to speak and so on. It embeds political assumptions. And my argument would be that if we start from the idea of organizing as a forms of politics, if you like, as a prefiguration of a particular way of being, then our problems aren't solved because there's not one, one form of organizing that's going to save us. But at least the world is opened up and the university gets a proper discipline, not, not simply a finishing school for capitalism, 
that doesn't teach about all the other forms of organization that are possible. And that's why we should shut down the business school. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Yes, Lars, friends, uh, over to you. Or over to me. I think it was over to you, Meta. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Okay, I, I'm, I'm ready. No, thank you so much, Martin, for this uh, excellent analysis of what's wrong with the, with the business school uh, that we all engage in and, uh, and for suggesting, you know, a school for organizing. Uh, I think I really, really enjoyed listening to you and, and also you starting out with sort of, you know, talking about how we are challenged as business schools, how we do not enjoy a good reputation how uh, we are critiqued uh, and how we also are very good at critiquing ourselves, by the way. And in contrast, if I may say to, to you know, um, our friends, our colleagues in the engineering, in the technical sciences, our friends, our colleagues in the natural sciences are much less exposed to the kind of critique that we as, as management scholars and as business schools uh, are. are. Uh, but that's of course another uh, discussion. I uh, also uh, enjoyed your, you know, your uh, analysis of education uh, or I ideology, and actually the education we are providing to our students in business schools is an ideology, uh, even though we like to think of that it's not. Uh, even though if we ask our colleagues in many disciplines across many disciplines. They, uh, they may probably disagree with you. So I really enjoy listening to you and really think that we need this, uh, what we may call radical critique of the journey we have been on, where we come from and also where we're going to. I would then say now, you know, that I'm wearing the, the hat here in my new capacity over the past two years as head of Prime, Principles for Responsible Management Education. And I'm happy to see, you know, a lot of familiar faces here in, in this uh, conversation today as well. I would say maybe we are, Martin, and I would love to hear your, your comments on that. Maybe we are what you say, a gentler, gentler form of critique. Maybe that's what we are providing here uh, in, in the prime community. Because I hear, not in your, your words maybe uh, directly, but I do hear a lot of concerns about the kind of education we deliver, the kind of uh, education that is needed and the gap between these two that uh, even businesses are you know calling for uh, even them saying that they uh, find it difficult when i'm sort of traveling the world on my screen or in in person i hear a lot of the businesses and the un global compact you know where we have 15,000 businesses signed up and when i talk to some of them they also say well we, we can't recruit the talent that we need because these these many of the students we we get they are sort of what uh, professor kurana would call mere craftsmen or what you refer to as you know sort of technically technically trained um, students. And what is needed is maybe what Humboldt uh, was talking about, that Ausbildung, not just the Bildung, but the Ausbildung, which is to with the ideal of creating world citizens um, who are sort of more critically engaging. And I, I'm sort of listening to you, I was sort of thinking that maybe what we're teaching is one way of this success, one way of what success for a business school means what one way for of success for a business leader and there is one only one way and that is the growth and the shareholder um primacy what we are doing i think uh, you know pushing with the, the the responsible management pushing pushing for with we're looking upon sustainability critiquing our growth paradigm uh, is that gentle form of critique and I think that we need the radical critique, but we also do need that gentle form of critique that we are providing in Prime, because we do need schools who are not even embarked on this journey to start, you know, and think maybe they could rethink the curriculum. Maybe they could rethink the educational practices brought into the classroom. And then those who are already uh, doing a lot out there and, and have been in the in the self-critique for many years, um, how they also uh, can, you know, set an, a tone. Uh, but then again, we are embedded in a system, and I would love to hear your reflections on that. We are embedded in a system where we are also as business schools um, striving to become number one on the rankings, on the, uh, for example, on the Financial Times rankings. And here to be, to be number one, 
you need to create a me first attitude in your students and in your school because 40 percent of that ranking more or less it depends on the speed with which you are alumni the day that they graduate and two three years from then the speed and increase of their salaries the, you know the, the speedier the higher the increase of the salary the higher we get on the rankings list so we need to you know we need to focus on ourselves and how we are structured but we cannot do that without critiquing and having that ecosystem with us so now of course i'm going to do a little promo here for what we're doing in prime because we are working with that ecosystem we are you know engaging with financial times and the rankings we are engaging with aacsb and the other afmd you know the accreditation bodies uh, around us to have them nudge business schools and business school deans a, a little bit so i think that is that is another huge dimension of the critique that i think um really needs some uh, analysis and needs some uh, attention <clears throat> and of course the last thing i want to say here uh, to you and i would love to hear reflections on is what i hear a lot and now you know that i've just been in africa and i, I was in uh, as, uh, in thailand in in asia last week and here i hear a lot of deans talking about more south south collaboration because in the south global south so-called global south as we know this is where the climate change problems are but this is also where many of the solutions are but they're just not scaled because they don't have the resources or they don't have the, the finances uh, to scale this but that's where we can find a lot of the solutions that we are looking for in the so-called global north south uh, global north i'm sorry so i think that's south analysis and i would really like to see your analysis extended to a south business school analysis and what that reality in those business schools would look like although i know of course many of them very inspired from a north uh, perspective perspective but i also do see other tendencies here for real societal engagement with local communities in research projects for professors, for students, they're sent out there to do something, not just to study, but also to do something as part of their educational program. So these were sort of my reflections uh, about, you know, the gender form for critique needed, the uh, the the success analysis, uh, you know, what 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 is the redefinition of success that we need to do, and you have the school of organizing that you bring in, and then the south south sort of uh, focus but also the fourthly the ecosystem that we need to take into consideration but thank you so much much martin i, I just want to say and you know a couple of years ago when i was some years ago when i was a professor at stockholm school of economics my students at that school were super inspired by your you know your your radical critique and your bulldozing uh, uh, you know um, article actually so much so they went back to the to form a little group of climate uh, students, activists, and they called all us professors uh, on a Friday afternoon to come and listen to how they, inspired by, by your sort of, you know, call for, for action, they took action and they challenged us on how much we actually, how little we actually put, for example, climate change into the curriculum in that sort of degrowth uh, narrative. So, uh, so you did have some impact there in, in, in Stockholm <laughs> and of course uh, in other spaces, but that was my little local uh, narrative to bring here today. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Meta. That's really, that's really kind. Um, Franz and Lars, shall I respond to Meta or do, do you want to go next? No, go ahead, Martin. And then, uh... <laughs> We'll That's great. Yeah. Uh, uh, th thanks. Thanks ever so much for the um, Stockholm um, example. That's 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 really nice to hear. I do because I haven't talked very much about students and the importance of thinking about students and um, um, and, the, and the way in which we cultivate a particular kind of student. I take that to be in part, you know, some of your remarks about uh, about um, uh, Humboldt and, and, and kind of ideas about the kind of personality, the sort of character that we should be imagining that we're going to cultivate. Much of the popular cultural critique of the business school is precisely about the character of the business school graduate, isn't it? About this idea that it's it's teaching selfishness, if you like, that it's uh, that it's that the business schools are crucible for producing a particularly unpleasant kind of character who goes on to have particularly unpleasant kind of consequences for the world. So that might be a really important um, way of uh, a kind of a lever to think about um, what graduateness might mean in the context of the business school. 
In terms of rankings, absolutely, I agree completely. I've been talking to a couple of people about the sort of um, how we might leverage the rankings in different kinds of ways, because they're clearly very important not only in terms of the, the kinds of things that are done by the business schools that appear in the rankings, but also by the kind of business schools that don't appear in rankings that might be in other parts of the globe who, who in, in, in a sense, see that as the apex of business school education. Um, but it, it, it is highly dysfunctional process, absolutely. And focusing on you know, salaries and all the rest of it is... Um, uh, such a strange metric. I, you know, as I said, I, I work at the University of Bristol now, and we're just starting a, a business school, um, and it's routinely being talked about as a top twenty business school, as if top twenty could somehow be detached from a series of processes which produce a certain kind of competitiveness, but also a certain set of ways of thinking about how you get into that top twenty, and so on. And then the last point you made, and it's one that I'm. I, I, I agree with completely, but I am, I, I'm, I'm not the right person to ask really, is um, the importance of thinking about the global south and other, um, other ways of imagining what business education might look like. I'm very sympathetic to this kind of idea in part because of course, I assume that organizing takes place in different places in different ways. My original, my first degree was in anthropology. You know, and anthropology is a kind of discipline, which is, if you like, based on the idea of the variety of ways in which human beings um, organize um, across um, different times and spaces. Um, that's, you know, that's its bread and butter, if you like, isn't it? So it seems to me entirely sensible to imagine that we would have local or regional ways of thinking about organisation that did not simply ape or map onto, if you like, the Harvard Business School curriculum, that used different kinds of concepts or assumptions um, that, that reacted to cultural or spiritual context in different kinds of ways and so on. Um, I wish I knew more about it, Meta, and, and, and I wish you all the very best with engaging with that kind of global south business education. Lars or Franz. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, um, Martin. Um, I'll go first and then, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll give the floor to uh, Lars. Um, Martin, uh, allow, allow me to be very direct, if you don't mind. Um, uh, I think you sound much, Dutch, so I suspect you will be anyway. I, I, I take full advantage of the fact that I'm Dutch that I'm supposed exactly. to be any opportunity <laughs> that I get. So, um, it, personally, I, I, I would think that anyone that takes our common future seriously and, and understands the role of education in that could not possibly disagree with what you've just said. Um, simultaneously, um, I cannot help but think that that you talked about tuition fees um, and, and, and some of the silliness involved that when you look at the amounts involved. Um, and basically the fact that only those successful in our current socioeconomic system could possibly pay those fees. Um, and, and you talked about corporations, but we all know that some of the biggest business schools have very intense uh, relationships with those same corporation, corporations um, and links to our political system. So basically, business schools have been really embedded in our current socioeconomic system. And as, as such, there's a, there's a self-reinforcing mechanism at place there, a, a lock-in, um, just like for that overall socioeconomic system uh, based on capitalism. Uh, so you would, you would assume that like that socioeconomic system, business schools are not going to change or disappear or be replaced by themselves. Uh, certainly not as long as that socioeconomic system is in place. So this makes me wonder, I'm just gonna, gonna, just gonna throw this out uh, to you and, 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 and you respond the way you want. But Martin, if you're really honest, um, do you actually think that business schools will be replaced by schools for organizing? Um, or are you asking for something that you know will not really happen? Um, and if so, why? And if you do believe that they will be replaced by schools of organizing, when will this happen, Martin, and how? Uh, and it, while I'm at it, 
But what about the whole economic system then? When is that going to change and how? So I would love to hear your response uh, to those questions. Lars, shall I, shall I respond to France now? Please do so. Yeah, okay. yeah beautifully expressed, France. And it's the kind of the, um, uh, it's the conceit at the heart of the book, right? You know, this idea, and, and partly you know, the way that the publishers wanted to sell the book, you know, the shut down the business school and all the rest of it. It's a nice provocative title. Um, nonetheless, there, is, there are, there are, there are two, two, two key things to add, I think. One is that um, because I am, um, skeptical about you know the kind of the gentle critique as as, as Meta Meta mentioned it. I, I wanted to make sure that I was being um, I was being clear that radical reform was necessary. That it's not enough just to add a CSR module or to talk about you know having a diverse board or something along those lines. That radical critique is necessary precisely to be addressing those kinds of questions about organisation. In other words, that co-op should be seen to be as important as uh, as the corporation. That you know B corps were mentioned here, for example. That you know B corps are fairly soft and, and gentle critique, but that they should be embedded into the way in which we think about. Uh, um, think about forms of organization and all the rest of it. The other part of what I was trying to do, if you like, was to kind of call on the idea of the university um, and to say, and I guess, you know, something um, uh, sort of particular here for business schools based in universities, to say that, that the university in its universalism has a certain kind of promise to it, that it assumes that, you know, if you're studying biology, you will be you know, broadly studying all biology, that you will have a curriculum which is produced by experts who know about biology, who um, who are trying to train people to be biologists, to develop the field, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you like, there's a kind of, there's a sort of an implicit promise in that of there not being too many exclusions. And if exclusions are found, then they are deemed to be problematic. Uh, it seems to me that the business school is so far away from that that in a sense it betrays the promise of the university because effectively what it's doing is only teaching about particular forms of economy and exchange and organization so effectively the business school if you like is kind of betraying the possibility of the university and in that sense i guess this, this, this is one of the kind of the levers I often try and use in order to open up the question of, you know, should the business school be replaced by something I call a school for organising? Now, one of the responses to that from various people has been, well, you're basically trying to construct a sociology department then. You know, that, that, that effectively the business school will become a sociology department of some description. I think that's partly true, but more generally, I would like to see um, a school for organising slash business school, which is much more informed by history, by sociology, by geography and so on, um, and much less isolated, constructed as a kind of an isolated and separate discipline within the university itself. Um, after all, you know, many of our social scientific and other colleagues are as profoundly suspicious of the business school as uh, many ordinary, ordinary citizens too. So coming around to answering your elegantly posed question, France, um, I, I, I don't see a school for organising happening anytime soon. But I think that the idea of the school for organising still has a certain kind of function, that it is, it's a useful rhetorical foil to make people think about the importance of really radical changes within the business school if we're to address the species threatening crisis that faces us. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Lux. Yes, <clears throat> just a brief reflection or actually perhaps a couple of questions uh, and we can turn to the uh, questions of the other people in the, uh, the session. Uh, a lot of what you said, of course, resonates with me for, for sure. Also the way in which you express some of the critiques that you um, have. The, one question up front, will management still be taught in the school of organizing? Yes, because it's a form of organization. Exactly. That's what I thought. Yeah. yeah. So, and th then my question would be, 
given some of the critiques that you have on the idea of management, of business, etc., cetera, uh, are there any kind of principles or principled boundaries in a sense uh, that you deem uh, important that we should kind of work our way around? For example, one of the things that stuck with me is one of the slides that said, and that's also the kind of the, the promise of business schools, business education is life changing. And I was just thinking, indeed, it is life changing because we're crossing so many of the planetary boundaries currently, right? So, and then in a sense, you could say business education uh, is very much aimed at the careers in business, of course. Business uh, is a lot of, uh, and also the absence in a sense of government policy, but business to a large extent is one of the culprits, right? That we're uh, passing these um, planetary boundaries. So I was just thinking, are there any principles, kind of hard lines that you have for teaching teaching business? Is this, is this kind of the, let's say the sustainability agenda taken seriously or is there more to it or perhaps less? So I'm not quite sure I've got the whole question here, but let me let me let me try and respond, Lars, and then you can you can tell me if I've got the question right or or wrong. I, I suppose that the best way to illustrate my perspective on this kind of stuff is to think to that that dictionary, that you know, huge quarter of a million word dictionary. And in a sense, if if we take organizing seriously, organizing an exchange is the kind of two key concepts in this. So basically, how do we put the world together? Yeah, and uh, and, and and exchange things in order to give ourselves lives which sit within uh, sit within the donut, if you like. Um, then all 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 forms of organizing uh, are legitimate uh, within that kind of curriculum, and that includes includes talking about some kind of stuff that liberals like us might find quite unpleasant as well. Within the dictionary, for example, we had entries on fascism and on the mafia and various forms of organizing that um, exemplified certain sorts of principles of centralization and leadership and the rest of it. Um, and we teach, you know, I would want to teach about them there precisely in order to illustrate some thing about the variety of different organizational forms. Now, I don't, in doing that, necessarily, you know, endorse those organizational forms, but I think it's really important to lay out that. If you're going to take questions of diversity, experimentalism, variability, and all the rest of it seriously, then you need to teach about a whole variety of different alternatives, different ways of thinking about how human beings and things can come together to do stuff. There are then a series of, if you like, moral slash ethical questions about what kind of world we as humans want to inhabit. And there's also a series of, if you like, environmental ecological questions about what the externalities of any business form might be. So it's kind of important that we recognize the variability of these issues, but also that simply play, placing out, if you like, a kind of a... Um, um, a platter of alternatives doesn't solve the question in itself. We've still got moral or political issues that we need to address. Exactly. Does that? It, yeah, it, it does answer my question indeed, because that was kind of what I was looking for to to understand. So, what's kind? Of, I mean, in the end, I think we should have also within the prime community, of course, and within the prime community, this is perhaps much more clear in a sense than beyond the uh, community. We, I think we should have some kind of principled position, right, on these grand challenges uh -huh. that we are faced, uh, that we are faced with. So in the end, um, uh, I, I think in my in my view is that a lot of management education is kind of uh, taught in a sense that uh, it's amoral, right? So, uh, uh, but 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 it's just my opinion. I think amoral in the current day and age actually means immoral. Um, and so, and that's also why I see, uh, for example, students that are taking more, let's say, the radical initiatives. I also saw this, by the way, in the one of the questions. And a lot of, I think, feelings that we have within the management education community, uh, I think it goes for faculty, it goes for students, is, uh, I mean, so, some kind of desire to really 
push things forward, right? So within the system, beyond the system, and it also was an interesting part of the, that also Meta thought about the gender critique. And I tend to see this gender critique with, in the, with the CSR agenda, sustainability agenda as more as kind of an advocacy kind of thing rather than a form of activism, right? That really tries to push the boundary of the system that we have organized things in, including management education. Uh, and that's one final comment or one, one final question, uh, also because that's in the question in the, in the chat, it's about radical, right? Um, so how could we make critical management studies more impactful, do you think? Uh, because uh, if I kind of put it bluntly, I see the CSR agenda, sustainability agenda, sustainability business agenda, really pushing forward the corporate agenda, right? Which is not very radical in a mm -hmm. sense. Uh, it's kind of uh, reproducing existing power structures, right? So how can we kind of confront or challenge the, these power structures? Is, is critical management studies, is that a, a proper way to do this? How can we make critical management studies more impactful according to you mm, mm. yeah let me let me start with that 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 question last really because i am despite the fact i spent an awful lot of time you know being uh, sort of working within and being identified with uh, critical management studies um i do feel kind of rather out of love with it now it seems to me that it's it's has been an, a kind of uh, um a sort of paradigm case of um, academics from the global north arguing about Foucault and Marx a lot, um, and though it's produced lots of uh, lots of work, um, lots of journal articles and, and and books and even you know encyclopedias and handbooks and all the rest of it now, um, much of that has largely been internal to the university and the business school itself. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of skeptical about critical management studies and its possibility for being um, impactful in the kind of context that I'm talking about. I guess I'm also interested, and this sort of relates back to the, the, the first bit of the question, in the, um, the, the ways in which we can use the concept of organizing uh, in order to construct a different way of thinking about uh, about management education more broadly. Um, and that means kind of, if you like, dislocating many of the kind of the, the conventional targets of, of critical management studies. After all, critical management studies has spent, you know, spent, spent 30 years chewing away at, um, at management, saying that management is a problem, da, 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 da. And I kind of agree with that. You know, that's all, all true and so on. But that's, that's basically a form of, if you like, negative critique. What I'd like us to be doing is to be kind of turning to the opening up the question of organization and trying to think about how we would build um, a form of organization and also a curriculum that allows us to talk about the different ways in which human beings can come together and do stuff and not just be moaning about the ways in which management is currently constructed. Because that's not going to help us very much. I mean, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit like, you know, in, in British University where I work, there's lots and lots of climate change scientists. They've established without any doubt that climate change is happening. The question now is what we do about it. Yeah, that seems to be a kind of an analogy for, yes, management is clearly a problem. So what are we going to do about it? Yeah, what are we going to change? Um, so I, you know, I, I want I want a kind of an affirmative curriculum in that sense. You know, I want one that's about the production of alternatives. And the last remark, if I may, which is again about students, my sense is, and you know, teaching the students that I teach at, at Bristol, and I, I, I should think this is unique, that many of them are they know that climate change is happening. They've seen the pictures of the last polar bear dying on the last iceberg. They. Um, understand that they're routine li routinely lied to by big corporations, uh, that they can't fly as much as they want to, et cetera, et cetera. They, they get it. You know, they're not, they're not stupid people. What they don't get is what they can do about it, you know, beyond recycling. 
So surely our job then should be to give them a positive sense, an affirmative sense of the possibilities for different forms of organisation and exchange, which allow us to build a different kind of economy. You know, that's that should be our historic role, right, is to kind of to help them think about how they construct a new world. Great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Frans, Mette. Any other oh. comments, reflections? Maybe I can and follow up on, on that real quick, uh, uh, and then I'll give the floor to you again, Meta. But uh, th th actually, what you just said, Martin, uh, re reminds me of a question that a student asked me uh, a few weeks ago in one of my classes. Um, my classes are on sustainability, uh, about the need to change our socioeconomic system, much in line with what we discussed today. Mm -hmm. um, but then one of the students asked me afterwards, um, I get it. Uh, I'm one of those that is worried about what's going to happen to my future, um, all of that. But my next class is with an economics teacher who's <laughs> going to teach me about profit and loss of businesses yeah. and corporations. How do I respond to a lecture like that? What do I do as a student? And to be quite frank, I did not know what to tell that student. Do you know what to tell that student, Martin? <laughs> um, business schools are divided places, Franz, aren't they? And, and you know, every yeah. business school I've ever worked in over the last 20, 30 years, I've had a bunch of people who were my allies who were usually moaning on about red or green things um, and a bunch of people who didn't understand what we were doing in business schools because they were interested in capital finance and how you construct ever more devilish derivatives, etc., whatever it might be. Um, I kind of assume that's why we need radical change. So in answering that student, I'd say ignore that person, <laughs> that lecturer, and listen to me, yeah, because... This is politics, right? You know, you can you can you, you, you can witter on about um, the importance of a diverse range of opinions, but if someone's teaching about uh, financial instruments that have brought us to the verge of financial collapse, then you know, surely there is a problem, right? So, um, I assume that we're going to have to do. There, there will be quite a lot of struggle over the uh, the reconstitution of the business school as we decide whether or not um, we're going to be part of the solution or part of the problem. Like, you know, for example, and this is a, a very small example, you know, I, th I think that it should be mandatory um, for every single module to be teaching about climate change now. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I simply don't think there's any, any principled reason why you could avoid that. And that would mean that lots of the ways in which we think about, say, capital markets and investment and all the rest of it would necessarily have to change too, you know, but I don't think people should be given a choice in this stuff. You know, in that sense, I would be a Stalinist dean of my school for organising, just say, you know, you address climate change or you're not working here. Yeah, you, know, you, can, you can go and work at Warwick if you want or somewhere. <laughs> But not here. Um, I'd, I'd, so yes, I'm afraid I'd, I'd be taking quite a hard line on that front, I think. But maybe I can continue then, because I think yeah. maybe, you know, maybe I, maybe where, you know, when we talk about the activism that then the radicalism that you are, you know, arguing for and the what I, well, I think it was actually yourself called the gender form, form of gentler form of critique mm. maybe maybe there is not really any disagreement at all it's a way of how we frame the need for this change for example the climate change discussion of course that's what we are we are in, that's what we're trying to do with prime that's one of the things of course we should have climate change not as an elective you know into mm. every every program of course you know and i i actually hear that is also a concern not just among students of course but also deans, because they are very concerned about their own relevance. They are concerned about the relevance of the business school, mm. because they can see how corporate academies, and now I'm talking about both the private and also the publicly funded, which there are many of, have in some countries, for example, Thailand, where I just was, the public universities have a lot higher prestige than the public ones. Oh, I'm sorry, than the private ones. Okay. So, so and in Denmark, for example, I'm a Danish citizen. Uh, you're not allowed to have private universities at all. So there are, you know, varieties, of course, around the world with, with that. But if we look upon private and publicly funded uh, universities, you, you'll hear the deans talking about their relevance, talking about their societal impact and how they are now 
nudged by the accreditation firms, but also by the governments, by the students, by their you know, local communities to argue for what is that societal in, uh, impact that you're actually contributing to and what is your relevance? Because if you're not relevant, it is, and that's mostly for the private schools, of course, then it's much cheaper to go to the Google Academy and pay the Google Academy for six months, uh, you know, yeah. craftsmanship on, you know, how do I become a financier or how do I become a technician yeah. or, you know, something like that, than taking the four-year undergraduate program at a university. So I think that there is also a concern about business school relevance that is driving in the same direction that you are arguing for, you, which is the good news, I think. We can argue yeah. it, goes, it goes too slow, but yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, that, that was what I was going to say is that, you know, that, 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 that sounds really helpful, but it sounds like a slow, slow process, doesn't it? And clearly we need to do this stuff, stuff, this, do this stuff very quickly. I suppose there's a broader issue there, certainly in the context of the UK, about the way in which um, private providers of different kinds uh, can outmaneuver old universities. And increasingly, I think, um, you know the, the the university, the Humboldtian University, if you want, Meta, is 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 kind of um, is seen to be rather a dinosaur kind of beast um, in our super speed digital world and so on. So so obviously we need to be thinking about how we sell inverted commas our forms of education to to young people, uh, well to all people, but but not simply assuming that the um, uh, the attractiveness of the idea of the university will be as obvious to our customers as it might be to us. Anything uh, from Thank your you. side, Max, to add to that uh, at this point? I think we also have some good questions in the... Uh, Samantha has left us, but she's raised some good questions. Uh, yeah, well... It's also Mary, Mary Lawson. Yeah, she had, a, she had a comment more than a question indeed. Um, but uh, Samantha's question um, was, was very much about uh, uh, whether we are, we are radical enough uh, in, in what we're doing. Um, and, and the whole idea of nudging versus more radical uh, ways to cultivate the need for change. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, contextualized by the, by the UK higher education uh, system uh, with a uh, if I understand correctly, uh, proposed sanctions being placed on courses that do not drive high employability prospects. Um, yeah. But maybe, maybe, Mary, you want to elaborate on this yourself? Uh, this was from Samantha. Oh, hey. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, just to comment about the UK context, then yes, sure. I mean, we currently have a government that's absolutely determined to be pushing uh, higher education towards a more and more uh, market-based set of forms um, and that means that um, all sorts of market-based sanctions are going to be employed in order to encourage particular forms of, uh, of behaviour and curriculum. Um, this is not the kind of behaviour that is helpful in our project but more generally I think it exposes the difficulties of having marketized higher education systems um, unlike you know, many of the countries represented here, uh, particularly the Northwest European ones, the UK is now such a market-based system that the vast majority of students are, of course, making choices on the basis of, um, is this useful for me in my future? Yeah, I'm, and my, my, my youngest son, um, who's uh, uh, at, at university now, when I was you know, talking to him about this kind of stuff, basically saying, well, you know, this is, this is a about fifty thousand pounds I'm spending, and I want to want to spend it reasonably wisely, of course. Um, and it's difficult to put young people in that kind of position, isn't it? To to expect them to be making decisions about long and collective futures when they are presented with highly individual debts that they're going to need to be addressing over the next 20, 30 years of their lives. So. Um, I think you know the, the the kind of the elephant the elephant in the room the usual elephant in the room here is about state funding for higher education of course. Mary, would you like to uh, add to the uh, discussion by means of your comment? Um, sure. And boy, so many things could be said because um, in the United States, the the issue of you know. What am I getting for my money when you go to college and how long will it take me yeah. to pay it off has been long, you know, we've been long suffering. Um, yeah. But 
just to go back to the comment that I made in the question I asked, I mean, what about the business roundtable report and, and the B Corp movement? Um, do you think that these are just too little too late or they're, they're not radical enough? Or um, what do you think of efforts to infuse this in existing institutions? Because I think general, I mean, we're hoping generationally this is gonna happen from the groundwater because younger people are looking at the landscape. They know what the future will hold if they don't have, if we don't have any kind of stability in the climate or in the social infrastructure, um, you know, recent events in the US notwithstanding. What do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mary. I, I, I because, because of my um, my role at the university, I do quite a lot of work with um, local businesses of different kinds. And we've put on a couple of workshops with uh, B Corps and got involved with that kind of stuff. The, though there are plenty of criticisms one might make of B Corps, I'm not going to document them here. I, I kind of, you know, I am, I am interested in those kinds of ideas. But I can partly see them as a kind of, if you like, a gateway drug to more radical organisational forms. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the way that the, the B Corp... Um, uh, process is set up is I think really interesting and in asking all the right questions um, it doesn't necessarily go far enough in terms of thinking about what those solutions might be to my mind but nonetheless it gets um, employers and hopefully employees as well thinking about those things as part of their business practice so no I'm very positive about that and I think we should be teaching and engaging with those kinds of things indeed you know why not have a B Corp business school of some description um, that would be a really useful kind of marketing pitch that being said, it's not radical enough. You know, it needs to go further, but it's a start, and um, and one that in that sense I quite admire. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I, I guess more generally, sorry, more generally, I, I think my my sense of the politics of this is that we need to be finding as many allies as we can, holding hands with as many people as possible. And being kind of narrowly sectarian, saying that, you know, only co-ops count or something is not going to work. Yeah, that we need to put our arms around all our friends and encouraging to be, them to be moving quickly in these particular directions. And I guess going back to that sort of, so it's haunted this conversation meta, the gentle critique thing, the, the danger, I think, of gentle critique is that it moves too slowly. Yeah, that it, it, it doesn't kind of assemble the social movement, the... Um, um, uh, the crowd that is required to push this stuff in 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 what to me would be helpful directions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree more actually about that. Every Thanks, every solution friend. needs to be tried. Yeah, that's yes, I think so. Yeah, but that kind of fits with my general approach, doesn't it? I mean, I think you know, if I'm going to witter on about diversity and variety and experimentalism and all the rest of it, then you know, I, I can't simply construct a narrow sectarian party form and exclude anybody who doesn't agree with me. It's not, it's not really going to work. Not recommended. Thank you, uh, Martin, and. Uh... I think with, with, with that idea, actually putting our arms around our friends and push for change together, I think that uh, that seems like a, a perfect moment uh, to to end today's uh, session. Uh, and let's remember that that sentence while we uh, while we move on. Um, we hope that you have enjoyed and uh, have taken inspiration uh, from this uh, third and final session in our webinar series. Uh, a big thank you to uh, everyone that participated and everyone that will uh, watch this online later. Uh, and a special thanks to, to Martin and uh, Mette for your uh, insights and uh, reflection. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think this was a, a very worthy final session in our uh, series uh, this year, uh, and it has given us a, a lot of food for thought. Um, with that, that also means that we've now concluded our uh, second seminar series, uh, and we hope uh, that you have all enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, we think we've had some great quality contents uh, providing us with challenging ideas uh, for responsible management education and moving that forward. Uh, ideas like the one of putting uh, the arms around our friends and move forward that we can chew on for a while and, uh, and other ideas that we can actually implement immediately in our own schools and educational activities. So uh, as a final reminder to all, uh, all sessions have been recorded and are available on the uh, Prime website. Uh, and with that, Thank you again. Hope to see you on the next occasion. Uh, bye for now. Enjoy the rest of your days. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Franz. Thanks, uh, Lars. Thanks, Meta. Yeah, thank, thank you very you much. much. Thank you, Martin. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.